This is a Farm Doc Daily webinar. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Thank you for joining us today over the next oh, half hour, 45 minutes to an hour. We're going to talk about the arrival of the spotted lantern fly and some tips for Illinois farmers as to how to control or at least watch for the spotted lantern fly. Casey Athey is here. She's a specialty crops entomologist in the College of Agricultural Consumer and Environmental Sciences. Thank you for taking the time and being with us, Casey. We appreciate that. I will turn the floor over to you. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the spotted lantern fly today. And I'm gonna start with just a general sort of discussion about invasive species. So it's important to note that invasive species, of course, can be plants, animals, or microbes. Um, there is a list over there to the right that are um, plants and animals only. Um, but I should note that not every new species to an area is considered invasive. Um, Invasive species are organisms that establish and spread in new non-native environments, and they have to cause harm. The cause harm is very important to this. If you have a non-native species that isn't causing harm, it is not considered invasive. Um, and they can cause harm in a variety of ways. Um, I've listed several here. They can do you know, uh, uh, harm in, in all of these ways. I wanna note the bug I'm gonna talk about today, really the potential harms of that are these three. So in its new home, it may do harm or eliminate native species. Now that has not been shown yet, but again, it's a relatively new invasive. So this may be something that comes from the invasion of the spotted lanternfly. Attacks to forests are also possible. This thing does um, feed on a variety of trees. And of course, the most important effect here that we are probably likely to see here is um, some, some crop damage from this pest. So I've included some headlines here and some of these are from about two years ago. And here, uh, this first one from the New York Times that talks about how this could cost state economies hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, that it's a voracious plant eater. Other ones that are just like, just want them gone. They need to go away as quickly as possible. Um, and that we're having no mercy. This lists, this headline itself lists a variety of crops, apples, grapes, hops, native trees, um, uh, public guidance of kill it, squash it. A newer one, this is from a couple days ago that New York City is really dealing with this large infestation of uh, spotted lantern flies just within the city. Of course, that wouldn't be doing crop damage. And so just to give you an idea, of course, that this is a huge thing in the news and across the last couple of years, we've talked a lot about it and what we might do about it. So to give you an introduction of this bug, um, it is a native, to China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. Uh, it has actually invaded other countries within Southeast Asia as well as um, the United States. In 2014, we found it in Pennsylvania. Um, and it has steadily moved across the Northeast and down towards us uh, here in 2023. A uh, couple of weeks ago, it was confirmed here in Illinois. And the infestation that was found was in Cook County. Um, this thing is a, it feeds on plant sap. And so it, it sucks the plant sap out. It depletes, um, phloem and it weakens the plant as a result. Um, they produce something called honeydew, which is basically just sugar poop. And that leads to the buildup of sooty mold. And I should say spotted lanternfly is capable of consuming a variety of plants. I've seen estimates where it's somewhere between like 70 and 100 different species that it can actually feed on, but that does not necessarily mean it's going to be a problem for all of those species. Uh, it, it was likely going to be a problem for grape produ pr producers, 
Um, but I will talk about its impact on several plants um, as the webinar continues. So I should note too that a lot of the schematics that you'll see in this um, webinar are from Penn, Penn State Extension. Because Spotted Lanternfly started in Pennsylvania, a lot of the research and a lot of the work on Spotted Lanternfly has come out of Penn State. So they've put together some really good information about this pest so far. And so you'll see a lot of that throughout this talk. So this just kind of shows you um, the effect of this plant feeding that is not necessarily direct damage to the plant. It's sort of more indirect, where the spotted lanternfly is just feeding on the sap and again, pooping sugar and attracting sugar loving insects. So, one of the things that happens is you end up with these very sticky plants and in come ants, stinging wasps. Um, all those sorts of things. And so in addition to any actual damage this does to the plant, this can be an issue for agrotourism in that not only do you have these sugar poop pooping insects on your plants, but then you're getting stinging wasps coming in as well. Um, it also decreases just the, the processes within the plant, the photosynthetic processes. So again, a really nice schematic out of Penn State. This is to show you the life cycle of spotted lanternfly. And of course, this is the life cycle in Pennsylvania. Um, we expect that the timings of spotted lanternfly, the exact timings, might vary a bit here in Illinois, but the general life cycle will be around the same. Um, and so uh, this gives you a, a good idea of when you might expect to find eggs, nymphs, and adults in the environment of this bug. So I'm gonna start with the adults. Um, they're active right now, uh, and they are active um, from late July in through November. Um, and of course, when the adults are active, this is when the egg laying is happening as well. Uh, the eggs are laid during this time, and the eggs are actually what overwinters. So those adults are gonna lay the eggs, and then the eggs are gonna hang out all winter long. And in the spring, the eggs will hatch. And again, this is probably sometime in April. And I think it will be sometime in April here as well. Um, but the exact timings will be uh, will have to be figured out as, as this thing um, continues to establish. Um, and they hatch again sometime in April. And the spotted lanternfly goes through what are called instars. They go through four, which is just the different stages as they grow from hatching to, to adulthood. And those first three instars, the littler ones, are going to be found April through July. And that fourth one is July through August. And then, of course, the cycle repeats. Now, I should note here, too, that in terms of pest status, the adults are actually the ones that are doing more harm to the plants. The adults and the nymphs actually feed kind of differently. And so the real harm to the plants in feeding is actually from the adults, um, which is kind of different than um, a lot of our other pestivorous insects that tend to be the nymphs or larvae that are doing most of the actual damage. And so, um, as I mentioned before, spotted lanternfly does consume a variety of plants. But what's interesting about these guys is their preferred food plant is actually an invasive species itself. Um, the, the tree of heaven. And so tree of heaven is one of these invasive plants that just does a great deal of damage here. It's really widespread. Um, and it's known as stinking sumac, Chinese sumac varnish tree or stink tree, because it kind of has a strong offensive odor. Um, and that mostly comes from its flowers. Um, and this thing actually affects people in a variety of ways. It has a really aggressive root system that can cause damage to pavement, sewers, and building foundations. Um, and this thing will spring up quickly after forest disturbances, such as extreme weather or um, spongy moth infestations. And it really has advanced the spread of spotted lanternfly. 
One thing that is interesting about this bug is if spotted, lan spotted lanternfly would just eat tree of heaven, we'd actually consider this a beneficial insect. But that's not the case. Um, and obviously it's not the case because I'm giving this talk. Um, I also want to note that uh, this map from the USDA shows the areas that are very suitable for spotted lanternfly. Um, and this isn't meant to make anybody panic or think that we're going to be overrun by them here in Illinois, but you'll notice that Illinois is highly suitable for spotted lanternfly. Um, the reason for this is because this map, if I were to put the distribution of Tree of Heaven on top of this map, it would map almost perfectly. So the reason that our area is so suitable for spotted lanternfly is because we have a lot of Tree of Heaven here. Um, and so. Uh, this is something you know to keep in mind as well, is as this thing moves along, it's probably greatly facilitated by the presence of really its preferred host plant, which is an invasive tree called Tree of Heaven. So we talk a lot about all these different food plants that it can eat um, and Again, there's, there's quite a few of them, um, but what's interesting about this bug is that although they, on their observations in Pennsylvania, they find it on a variety of plants, there's really only two things that they find regularly having every life stage that can occur on it. So here in this, um, table, you'll see nymphs and adults, um, and you'll see in the pink bars is where they have found any of these on um, any of these types of plants. Uh, so roses, different perennials, um, several trees there, red silver maples, black walnut. But if you'll notice, only grape and tree of heaven do they find every life stage on it. So these things seem to be able to fully complete their life cycle on grape and tree of heaven, and maybe not these other plants. Now I've talked a bit about how spotted lanternfly is a um, nuisance pest, and if you'll notice, a fair number of the you know trees that are listed there are common trees people have in their yards, which is also part of a reason why people are encountering these you know regularly because these things can feed on common things that we grow regrow in our yards. Um, but again, it's really, really concentrated on grapes and tree of heaven. One of these things is very bad, the grapes. One of these things would be very good, tree of heaven, if it's, you know, eating those. And really to drive this point home, um, the next couple of slides are just to show you uh, how these bugs might move. So this was a recent study, very recent, just came out this year. And what they did is they paired plants that spotted lanternfly likes and that people care about. So they had tree of heaven. Every single one of these has a tree of heaven plant with it because again, it's its preferred host. And then they also paired it with something else. In the case of the top, they paired it with tree of heaven. Um, and then they paired it with grapes, apples, peaches, and black walnut which are really the things that at this point were, you know, more concerned about them being a pest of. And they marked the bugs so they knew which one, which plant they put it on first. Then they went through to look and say, okay, well, did the spotted lanternfly stay on Tree of Heaven? Did it stay on the grapes or did it move between the two? Um, and part of this is as we go forward, we, you know, there might be some chances for trap cropping. And so if everything constantly moved to Tree of Heaven, Maybe we try to use that in a control um, method. But the other thing here is just to see what these bugs prefer. So for the nymphs, in the case of apples and peaches, if it's paired with tree of heaven, they're gonna move back over to tree of heaven. They don't move off grapes as a note. Again, they really do like grapes. Um, they kind of like black walnut as nymphs, so they'll actually move off of tree of heaven onto black walnut. And as far as black walnut goes, what we're concerned about there is seedlings. So if you have a fully mature black walnut tree in your yard, probably don't need to worry about it. If you have seedlings, that's where the concern is there. And the adults, the 
the adults don't tend to move off of anything, except they move off of black walnut onto tree of heaven. And so at least here we see that things are not moving off of their preferred host, generally speaking, to our cultivated hosts. Um, and so that's actually kind of nice and good to see um, for as far as whether or not we should be concerned about them moving from tree of heaven to apple or peach. And then really to continue to drive this, they really like tree of heaven thing home. Um, there was some study, there was another study done um, in, uh, in Pennsylvania as well. Um, and so this is where they knew there were spotted lanternflies in the area and they put out plants of tree of heaven, grape, apple, peach, and black walnut and wanted to see um, uh, how the spotted lanternflies colonize those. And so you can see that in this graph, that yellow line is tree of heaven. And so across their life cycle, they're on tree of heaven. They're coming onto tree of heaven, they're colonizing it. And then they do tend to go onto black walnut as well. Now you can see, I've, I've not labeled the grape, apple, and peach lines next to them because you can hardly see them. There's just not a lot of the spotted lantern flies that were being found on those, which is really good news for us. But again, these are small studies and, uh, this isn't to say they, you know, won't be a problem for those crops, but at least it doesn't look like these lantern flies are really, really going after um, uh, these other um, crops in lieu of Tree of Heaven. And so, you know, this is not to say there's there's nothing here. Of course, you can get tree dye back here. So on the left picture, there's tree of heaven, and that's showing you some of that tree dye back with that yellowing of leaves from heavy um, spotted lantern fly feeding. And then again, I've mentioned several times that these things can be a nuisance pest. And this picture on the right is from Pennsylvania. And you can see that tree trunk is really covered in spotted lantern flies. And this was from early days in the um, invasion, but you can see how on a tree in your yard, this could be a big nuisance for you and something that you'd have to deal with. Um, I don't imagine we are going to get numbers like this in Illinois, but we might. Um, it's definitely something to look out for. And as this thing moves along, of course, we, as we monitor, we'll learn new things about it um, uh, and hopefully be able to contain it more within our state than um, some other places have. Um, but I really think the focus for us here in Illinois going forward is going to be protecting great production. So really for the rest of our time this morning, I'm going to talk about spotted lanternfly control, at least what we know about it so far. Um, and I may repeat this several times, but just keep in mind that as a new invasive, there's a lot we have to learn and a lot of um, studies and research that we have to do to answer several big questions that, that are gonna come up as this thing moves um, into new areas. So um, spotted lantern fly control, uh, the first thing that I'll mention is manual removal. Now, when I say this, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about manual removal of the insect here in subsequent slides, but when I say this, I really also mean tree of heaven. So again, tree of heaven is bad, it's invasive. If it is in your yard, it's good to get rid of it. There's really no way to prevent spotted lantern flies from entering your property entirely. But if you can limit their food plants, that's um, a good way to start. And the best way to do this is to get rid of Tree of Heaven, which is easier said than done. Again, they have a really, really um, hardy root system. And often to kill it entirely, you actually have to kill that root system. And that can be really hard for sure, but you want to get rid of as much tree of heaven foliage from your property as you possibly can, because again, it's their favorite food. Um, so that's a, that's a part of manual removal. Um, the other things I'm going to talk about that research has been done on is use of row covers, and then I'm going to talk about insecticide options. 
Now, as always, standard disclaimer, always read and follow your label instructions. The label is the law. Um, don't spray things that are not labeled. Um, for spotted lantern flies, there lantern flies, there's been several label additions now that they've entered the United States for insecticides. It of course did not previously have them on the label. Other thing I want to note here is you'll see this B icon on subsequent slides. This is a label that will you will find on your insecticide or an icon you'll find on your insecticide label when that insecticide is particularly harmful to bees. It's a new EPA label that's been on insecticide labels for a couple of years, and you need to be on the lookout for that. Um, when I give presentations, and this is uh, no exception, you will find this icon on several subsequent slides next to insecticides that this is on their label. But please always look at the label yourself and look for this before you spray and then use a lot of caution if you're using an insecticide that contains this icon. So, manual removal and trapping. Um, kind of the first thing here is squishing, as I have mentioned. Um, now, squishing is not a bad practice for spotted lantern flies you encounter. You can just kill it. Of course, this is when they're being a nuisance. This is not a viable control strategy if you are a farmer, but it's still sort of our first line of defense. Please squish it. Um, and we'll probably continue to use that as a um, uh, control method. The other thing that you can use is there are trapping methods. There, there is a commercially available spotted lanternfly trap that you can use all season. It's to be, it's to put on a tree, and the way that it works is you put it around the tree trunk, and the spotted lanternfly nymphs will climb, climb up the tree trunk and then get stuck in the reservoir up top, and then um, they are no longer available to each plant. This can help you reduce numbers, also help you monitor for lanternfly activity. Now, I included the commercially available one. There's also a link on here you can see to how to build your own. You can build your own out of stuff you'd have at home. Uh, you can use a Ziploc bag as the reservoir, that sort of thing, if you would prefer not to buy a commercial one. Now, something to keep in mind here is that there are no um, economic injury levels for spotted lanternfly yet. So the research hasn't happened to say if you were trying to use this as a monitoring device to time when you sprayed, that's actually not what this is for yet. This is really more of a manual removal way. You get some of them just out of the environment by using this. Now you can use it to monitor. Of course, if you put it out and you start noticing spotted lanternflies, it is also a monitoring tool. But as of today, I'm not able to give you any advice on what level of lanternfly will cause economic damage um, in crops just yet. Uh, that research is um, ongoing. So I think really good news for this pest, in my opinion, is this study. Um, now again, this is one study um, so far, but use of row covers for excluding things, um, uh, for excluding insects are used across a lot of production. And this is of course in grapes, because as I mentioned, really grapes are what we're really primarily concerned about with this pest. And so what this study did is they actually put the row covers on in August. Um, and they had a mesh size, if anybody's interested, in 6 by 1.8 millimeters um, for their row cover. And they put that up when the adults were active. As I mentioned before, the adults are really the, the most harmful life stage for the plant. And they then monitored weekly with their netted and non-netted um, rows to see the abundance of the spotted lanternfly per vine. And what they found is basically there were none in the netted um, uh, vines. I believe over the entire season, over all of the vines, they found two in the netted vines, which doesn't even really make a blip because um, you can't even really see the dotted line there on this, um, on this figure. Uh, whereas the non-netted vines had quite a few spotted lanternflies. 
And of course, again, if you have a very large vineyard, this can be a really time intensive process. But given that row covers are used for a variety of things already, things like excluding birds, uh, hail netting, this is just another benefit of using row covers within your vineyard. The other thing I want to mention here, which was also very good news, is that the investigators didn't find any increase in disease, increase in humidity, any other things that you might imagine would happen under a row cover when you um, put them out like this. So this is a fantastic non-chemical control option. This is a great option if you're an organic producer, and it's a great option if you're a conventional producer because a row cover like this can also still spray through. Um, so that really concludes the published research into other ways of control. And so really going forward, I'm going to talk about um, insecticides um, because there's been a fair amount of research into insecticide options that can be used for um, this particular pest. Now, with the exception of just a couple of things, these are almost exclusively conventional insecticides. So again, if you're organic, you really want to consider trapping and use of row covers um, because those are kind of right now the options that have been shown to have efficacy. So what I will do is I will go through the life stages and what we know about what can help those. So for eggs, I want to mention here that one of the things that is recommended for eggs is that you actually scrape the eggs off and destroy them, which again is just manual removal again. But I want to throw a caveat in there because a lot of the eggs are laid on trees, on parts of trees that you can't really get to to do this. And so if you see a spotted lanternfly egg mass, you can remove it and destroy it great, but many of them you will not see. And so in order to try to control them, you need some other options. And so here, this was a study that was published in 2019, and it looked at uh, mortality of eggs in the field. So they sprayed these things and then, you know, saw how many actually hatched. And interestingly enough here, a uh, oil, which would be an organic option, has the best efficacy against the eggs. As with a lot of insects, eggs are kind of hard to kill. These things are pretty protected, um, and so aside from smushing. Uh, and so it's not really all that surprising that the egg mortality isn't super high, but you can get a 45% mortality there with using oils. But you, of course, have to get good coverage. You have to really spray well because those eggs need to be smothered. Um, the other products on here, the two neonicotinoid products, the two conventional insecticides here, um, venom and a sale, don't do a very good job. Um, there's, a, of course, a little bit of mortality, but not great. And as you'll note, this is my first time of showing you that B label there. So venom um, is an insecticide that carries that, that B label. It's really, really dangerous for bees. You absolutely cannot spray it when anything is flowering. Um, and you need to be very careful if bees are active in using it. And in the case of eggs, it's not really doing much mortality there for us anyway. So I think if you're going to be choosing an insecticide that targets the eggs, probably just stick with oil. Um, it is going to be your best choice for that life stage. So if we move on to the next life stage, to nymphs, um, in this study, everything they looked at actually had pretty good efficacy, actually pretty great efficacy, as it turns out. Um, and so we've got quite a few different modes of action here. Um, we've got uh, several neonicotinoids here, a sale, venom, terra, um, carboyl here with seven, and then we've got a uh, pyrethroid here um, and uh, another mode of action there with imidan. Now, takeaway here is that the nymphs are pretty easy to kill, generally speaking, um, which is good news. Uh, some of our insects, like brown marmorated stink bug, are kind of a hard to kill insect. This one is actually pretty easy to kill. But again, I will note two of these that have pretty great efficacy also carry that B label. Um, and so again, always keep that in mind uh, and 
um, you want to be careful. And of course, here, if you're having spotted lantern fly problems, um, uh, you want to rotate chemistries. And I should note here that these were grape foliage that was sprayed with insecticides. So again, with a lot of these recommendations, I'm really focusing on grapes. The reason being is that the other crops currently, you don't really have a reason to spray for spotted lantern fly, um, even if you have a few in your in your fields. Really, grapes are are where the damage is going to occur, and that's where you're going to need to worry about spraying these insecticides. And a lot of the studies so far have definitely focused on, on that crop. Now with this one, um, this is in the lab. So I don't have any, we don't, I don't have any data to show you insecticides for the adults in the field. Um, as they fly around, it's harder to pin that down um, outside of outside of the lab. Um, but I'll note here that uh, the nymphs, again, as I mentioned, that's the number on the left there on the right column. And the nymphs are, again, pretty easy to kill. This is mortality at basically spray. This is at zero hours. This is I sprayed it and they died. Um, and so you can see all of these products kill the nymphs very easily, which again, is fantastic news for a new invasive that we're trying to tr control. The adults are harder. So some of these things, again, two products that carry that B label, do really well with killing the adults in the, in the lab. But this is not field. Um, and then you'll notice that several of those products don't seem to at all. Um, and again, this is great plants. Um, and so when you're doing your sprays, the adults are the most destructive life stage, but if you can focus on those nymphs, you have an easier time of, you know, really getting those, those taken care of. Um, now, this is another lovely Penn State uh, document here. And I want to note here again that we have this, these management options these things will change as we learn more about this. This is a tentative management schedule. When, if you have a spotted lanternfly problem in your grapes, when you want to deal with, with it in the different ways. Um, you'll notice the top line is don't move any life stage. So these things move around pretty quickly or easily. Um, we think one of the ways that they're actually moving is just hitching a ride on things. Um, cars and whatnot, uh, movement of maybe plants, that sort of thing. Uh, they just, it's easy for them to move across the landscape. Uh, and so we always recommend don't move spotted lantern flies. Obviously you wouldn't if probably on purpose, but just keeping in mind that human mediated movement will help move these around. Um, and so then our next thing is that scraping and destroying eggs that I mentioned. So those eggs are in the environment sometimes for a very long time. And so as you encounter them, especially as you encounter them from September to probably March, they likely haven't hatched. So scraping them and destroying them is important. One thing that I always tell people whenever you're removing insect eggs from anything, please don't just remove it, actually squish and destroy them. Because if you just take them off the tree and the eggs are still up, they're still, um, viable, they'll just hatch anyway. So you always want to destroy the eggs when you scrape them off. And obviously we have not included June, July, and August because the eggs, if you find egg cases during that time, they're probably old ones. Um, and then in order to try to smother those eggs, spraying those with um, horticult horticultural spray oils, as I kind of showed you some of the effectiveness of that earlier, you want to do that in February, March, and April. Um, that's the time to really be smothering the eggs. Um, and of course, that's going to get to eggs that you can't necessarily see. Um, and then those traps are recommended here as well that I showed, the circle traps. You want to use those pretty much all summer. You want to intercept those nymphs that are crawling up the um, tree trunks and uh, any adults that might be doing the same. Um, now, those are generally made for tree trunks. They're generally not made for grapevines, although I imagine as time goes on, there'll be some modified traps for that as well. 
But given that this pest will feed on black walnut and apples and peaches and a variety of other trees we just have in the landscape, the use of those circle traps are a good monitoring technique. And then we have some contact insecticide applications. You want to make sure that, again, those eggs have actually hatched. You want to wait until after hatch. Because as I showed before, contact insecticides aren't really doing anything to kill the eggs. And always avoid bloom. Um, again, if you're spraying something like an apple tree, you want to avoid bloom when you're spraying, which it, we always recommend. And then any systemic applications of insecticides can be done there in blue, uh, May through July. Um, and then if you want to do a different insecticide, different mode of action, don't just rotate through a neonicotinoid for a neonicotinoid, for example, then you can do that a little bit later, um, July through September. And so this, again, is a tentative schedule for how you might deal with this insect. The one thing that is not on this chart, and I'll note, is using those row covers. And so if you're using those row covers, you want to be doing that basically from August through October here. You want to put those row covers on. It doesn't seem like there's any need to put them on earlier um, when the nymphs are active, but really putting them on when the adults are active. However, that recommendation may change as we get more research into that. But right now what we have is if you want to wait till August to cover your um, grapevines, you could probably be pr free to do that and exclude those adult. Um, lantern flies. So the take homes here are that the spotted lantern fly is here in Illinois. Um, and so we have uh, an established population again in Cook County. We hope to be able to stop the spread of it um, through other parts of the state, but we're trying to do as much monitoring as we can um, to try to really be ahead of this invasive pest. It is and probably will continue to be a nuisance pest to people. Again, you can have sort of these large numbers when they're flying around as adults, they can be kind of annoying. Uh, I know there was a baseball game recently where they cut the broadcast for a second to note how many spotted lantern flies were flying around, and that was somewhere again in the Northeast. So it's not that they're not um, going to probably be a nuisance pest here, because they might be. As far as agriculture goes, really the biggest concern we have is grapes, that they will be a pest for grapes. Um, but I feel like there's a little bit of good news here. Um, one of that is that when we've been testing insecticides, there's a fair number of quite effective insecticides for this pest. And I think that's really good news because often with invasives, we kind of have things that are pretty hard to kill. And we have a really nice cultural control method with those the use of row covers. And so if you can do things like that, I think we can, as long as we're doing our monitoring and we know where it's at, I think we can kind of get ahead of this pest for um, uh, commercial growers at least. And again, if you can remove tree of heaven from your yard, which you definitely should do, you may also prevent them from being as big of a problem in your yard as well. And maybe we can get ahead of some of this nuisance pest part of it as well. So my pitch here, and I, this, this will continue to be true. If you see or think you see a spotted lantern fly, please take a picture of it and email it to lanternfly at illinois.edu. And we've got some um, uh, suggested uh, text to put in your email. We want to know where you found it. We want to know what date and what time. And even better yet, if you can describe what you found it on would be the best. So the location, what type of plant tree it was on, where it was on, that plant or tree um, would be fantastic. Um, and you can put that you've attached a photo of the lantern fly that you saw so that we can confirm that. And again, the more that we can monitor and confirm where it is, the more we can stay ahead of it and be able to give better recommendations for how to deal with it um, as it potentially moves through the state. 
And I will mention here that there's sort of a strategic goal here from the USDA um, that we really want to limit the spread of this. So although I have said, you know, it's really probably going to be a problem for grapes and not another a lot of other crops, one of the things we really don't know is how this is going to potentially displace or harm native species we already have here. And that's a big concern for invasive species. And we really want to limit the advancement of it so that even if it continues to move, we continue to have these scientific tools to deal with it and know what we're going to contend with as it moves across the landscape. We can get you different pest management options. One of the things that people are looking for, and I think as um, we go forward, is things like biological control. There might be some sort of a parasitoid out there that might help us to control this. And it would be excellent if we had some of that information before it continues to move across the landscape. So this slide just has my contact information on it. Feel free to email me or call me with questions. Um, I have put my uh, website up here. Feel free to check that out as well. Um, and thank you for your attention today. And thank you, Casey. If you have questions for Casey, please do drop those into the question box now and we'll get them answered uh, in just a moment. We would like to take at this time just a second to thank our sponsors as well. They include the TIA Center for Farmland Research, Compere Financial, Corteva AgriScience, Farm Credit Illinois, FS Growmark, the Illinois Soybean Association, and the Illinois Corn Growers Association, our educational partners, of course, or FBFM, that's the farm business, farm management folks here across the state of Illinois, the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics, U of I Extension, the College of Agricultural and Consumer and Environmental Sciences as well. You can always find this information again as the webinar in its entirety, anytime you'd like, in the archive section of the farmdocdaily.illinois.edu website, uh, or you can check out youtube.com backslash at farmdoc. You'll find all of the farmdoc videos uh, at that address on YouTube as well. It's a quick, a simple, easy way to find those, and we would appreciate it if you check those out. Again, I'll leave Casey's information up for just a second. Casey, thank you for being with us. Uh, I do have a quick question for you, and it is just a relative question. I made note that uh, of the things that are capable of controlling this insect, uh, oils do the job on uh, the, the younger uh, insect version of this. However, not all, not all oils. Is it about viscosity or something else that keeps soybean oil, uh, known as golden oil in this case, from controlling yeah, that's a really good question. And I imagine it probably is um, because there's a big difference between the two oils and there's nothing extra in either of those. There isn't an insecticide in one and not in the other. So I imagine it has to be viscosity that isn't fully um, smothering the eggs properly or you're not really getting good coverage with um, the soybean oil versus the, the other types of oil. And one final question based on the previous invasive species you mentioned, for instance, uh, the ladybugs, um, the Asian ladybug. Uh, I'm wondering how long you think it will take for spread to happen. That one didn't take but a few years. And the very first years, the populations are really high when it comes into an area. And then they level off as uh, there are other um, well, disease and other issues that uh, can tend to bring those populations down. How long do you think that? Yeah, I mean, you know, this this hasn't taken very long. You know, it showed up in Pennsylvania in 2014, and it's already all the way here um, uh, to Illinois, and it has spread relatively quickly. Now, based on the map, one thing that may stop it from spreading to, say, California very quickly is that there is a large amount of um, the country that doesn't really have Tree of Heaven. And so we may see that it sort of spreads to its natural end point here in the Midwest and then within the next couple of years and then doesn't really move if we can prevent it, doesn't really get into California. 
Um, now, it might, but it's not going to just move slowly across the country that way because there's a large part in the middle that its preferred food host isn't there. There is a question about uh, forestry in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, there are black walnut trees, of course, mm -hmm. in yards, but there are black walnut tree groves, mm -hmm. um, which people are hopeful for the several couple of generations out, uh, might be a, a very large income. How much of an issue uh, is this insect pest for black walnut trees in Illinois? Yes, so if you have mature black walnut trees, we don't have any evidence that it's a big problem for mature trees. Um, uh, however, if you have seedlings, you need to protect them. So you'll need to be spraying for the uh, uh, spotted lantern fly. For black walnut seedlings, there is some research that suggests that um, they can cause a lot of damage if not kill the small seedlings. And so, yes, for black walnut, that's the other thing that depending on the the um, size of your trees, you would need to um, worry about those as well. Casey Athey, thank you for spending so much time with us today and doing the webinar. Thank you for having me. I'm Todd Gleason. On behalf of Jim Baltz, who's been behind the scene, we thank you as well for joining us for this Farm Doc Daily webinar. Again, you can find it online anytime you like in the Farm Doc Daily website at farmdocdaily.illinois.edu. Look in the archive section. Have a good day.